to be the most accurate description of slavery at that point in time in America. Now they contain what is now dated language, and if you read it, you would say some of this is highly inappropriate and politically incorrect, but you have to take it in its time and place. And he was quoting slave masters and plantation owners and quoting slaves and trying to capture and commoners, if you will, poor whites, and trying to capture the essence of their accents and their way of speaking. And he really did an interesting job as a journalist to try to do that. Now, on one note, oh, and by the way, um, oh, yes, and during his brief period in his, uh, excuse me, and in addition to his stint as publisher and co-editor of Putnam's Monthly, Olmsted co-founded, co-founded the Nation magazine, played a key role as editor of that publication in its early years, the longest continuously published magazine of liberal opinion in America, co-founded it and edited it. And during his relatively brief period of his career, Olmsted befriended and published some of the most prominent writers and intellects of the day, basically members of the American literary renaissance and transcendentalists. To name but a few, and we're going to go clockwise here, I hope you recognize most of these, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, here's Herman Melville, that's Harriet Beecher Stowe, you could name add many others to this list, many others, Longfellow, Washington Irving, etc. And uh, Olmsted also had contact with several of the key painters of the, the next generation of the Hudson River School, including notably Frederick Edwin Church, a distant cousin from Hartford. I don't think they knew each other growing up, but it turns out they're distant cousins. And now this is not Church, but it's his famous Cats in Niagara Falls, of course, which was hugely influential. Well, you get the point. I, I could go on, but between Putnam's Monthly and the nation, through his social circle, his ties to the cultural leadership, his contacts were a veritable who's who of the arts and letters uh, during this time in America. And by the way, to that list can be added almost all of the great social reformers of the day, particularly those from Boston and New York, who were hugely influential across the nation at that time. One note, we tried in our film to give credit to Calvert Fox. Uh, Olmsted's partner with Manor brought Olmsted into the actual design of Central Park and subsequently convinced Olmsted to return to the business of park building once Prosper Park was in the offing. Poor Box, the sometimes neglected, lesser known partner, at least to the general public, but a great architect in his own right, however, a time, a man whose time seems to have passed over. It's important to understand the origins of the public park movement in North America. In the highly polluted cities of the 19th century, trees, shrubs, and lawns served famously, of course, as the lawns of the city, creating refuges of fresh air. Park advocates argued that parks provided refined imitations of nature, claiming that exposure to them would improve people's character, regardless of their social and economic status. Architect and landscape designer Andrew Jackson Downing himself wrote this in 1848, and I think it stands the test of time. This is what he wrote. Quote, parks will be better preachers of temperance than temperance societies better refiners of national manners than dancing schools, and better promoters of general good feeling than any lectures on the philosophy of happiness." Unquote. I mean, that's, that's pretty cool. It stands the test of time. Sentiments like that reflect the influence of the romantics on the New World's attitudes towards nature. What had once been seen something separate from humans to be conquered and fear became something humans could return to. Uh, Olmsted, uh, for, 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 for restoration, of course. Olmsted and Downing brought their experiences of touring European gardens to the U.S further emphasizing the beneficial relationship between humans and nature, and democratizing the public park experience. By the way, in, in New York, before Central Park, the only place for urban New Yorkers to recreate were the bucolic lanes of the Greenwood Cemetery. Still there today, still bucolic and beautiful. I highly recommend you visit if it's near Prospect Park. And by the way, uh, it was not the working class, however, who recreated here. No, on the contrary, it was the well-heeled New Yorkers who would show up in their Sunday finest after church in their carriage rides and to perambulate in their Sunday finest around these shady lanes of Greenwood Cemetery. Urban New Yorkers had nowhere to go. So, Olmsted was adamant that Central Park would serve everyone, regardless of their skin color, family origin, or economic status. I should emphasize here, by the way, the parks were also seen as instruments of public health. In fact, in mid-19th century New York, all cities were still dealing with terrible outbreaks of cholera. And, in fact, Frederick Law Homestead and Barry Homestead lost their first child during one of those epidemics of cholera in New York City. Uh, indeed, Central Park served as the lungs of the city. In their arguments supporting the design for Central Park, let's give you another image of Greensport. In their arguments supporting the design for Central Park, Homestead and his collaborator Vox wrote this in 1868. Bear with me, it's a slightly longer extra. Quote, there is no doubt that the more intense intellectual activity which prevails equally in the library, the workshop and the counting room, makes tranquilizing recreation more essential to continued health and strength. 
Civilized men are growing more and more subject to insidious enemies to their health and happiness. And against these, the remedy cannot be found in medicine or in athletic recreations, but only in sunlight in such forms of gentle exercise as are calculated to equalize the circulation and relieve the brain." Unquote. Now, somewhat archaic language there. You may not entirely agree for their case for uh, passive versus act active recreation. After all, times have changed. And even during the Olmsted Sun's tenure, believe me, athletic grounds were incorporated into many of those parks in the early 20th century. But uh, inter interesting, though, if you pay attention to what they were saying there, you could say that along with Henry David Thoreau, uh, Olmsted and Hawks were early proponents of what could be called forest bathing, a concept that in fact originated in Japan much in vogue at this time, as some of you know. But I have to wonder, ladies and gentlemen, what Olmsted would think if you were here with us now in a park environment, be it a city park, a county park, state park, national park, and you would see people wandering around with wires dangling from their ears, or funny, or funny looking little protuberance coming out of their ears, or even worse, even worse, like this tree on the park bench, <laughs> entranced by their shimmering screams rather than taking in the rich, multi-central experience of the natural world. And by the way, I can point the finger at myself, I've done this, but okay, I'm not just pointing at you, I'm pointing at myself. I wonder what Homestead would think. Okay, well, enough with that silliness. Now, our, food, our film zooms in on the stories of Central Park, Prospect Park, Buffalo, and Boston's Emerald Necklace, as some of you might know if you've seen it. A few uh, comments about this project before I move on to other sites and other members of the family. Homestead and Box, by the way, considered Prospect Park their masterpiece. As for one, they weren't hemmed in by a rectangular area as they were at Central Park. They didn't encounter nearly the same level of political or fiscal interference in their work. And likewise, they didn't need to make as many compromises with their original design. By the way, I have to show you a picture. When I first entered Endale Arch you know, decades ago, it was a dank, dark tunnel. And it remained that way until just a couple of years ago. Here's Oh, I, missed, I, I don't have a before and after picture. Well, just to let you know, uh, Endale Arch has been restored with magnificent tiger stripe wood paneling, and the, all the, uh, the stucco work, uh, concrete has been refinished, restored, and the wood of the interior. Uh, and you must, if you're in New York, especially if you've never been to Prospect Park, but even those who have been in prior years, take the Grand Army Plaza entrance through the Endale Arch and see what they've done. Then you come into the magnificent expanse of the long <coughs> It is extraordinary. Now, about Boston, my hometown. Uh, 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 the Emerald Necklace, in fact, the Emerald Necklace began with the Back Bay Fence project. Here is Olmsted's original 1887 plan on the left. There is the modern day Emerald Necklace Conservancy map on the right. There's an expanded version of that map. This is what it looks like today. By the way, this was the uh, title that the fence, the Muddy River going through the fence, was fed into the tidal basin of the Charles River. It was the public sewers for the city of Boston. It was a mess. This is what it looked like when Olmsted tackled it in eight, at this time period. And you can point to this as the first true wetlands restoration project in the history of the United States, what Olmsted did there in the fence in the 19th century. I could talk about many of the delightful discoveries in the making of this film. In fact, one was Buffalo. Before beginning research on the film, I hadn't been to Buffalo since I was six years old. I had no memory of the city of Buffalo. I did have a somewhat of a memory of Niagara Falls, certainly. But you could say that the Olmsted Park System in Buffalo arguably is the best preserved and maintained in all uh, America. An extensive park system. Uh, by the way, here are two of the parks. Uh, the more famous ones, Delaware Park on the left, Front Park on the right. I'll show you more later. And it's worth noting that the Buffalo Park System, by the way, were designed as the first truly integrated park system ever built in the United States. All the parks connected by parkways and landscaped traffic circles at the time. The whole idea behind this, I have images for you of the parkways too, that's the historic uh, Lincoln Parkway on the left with equestrian traffic on it, modern day Bidwell Parkway on the right. No, these are not narrow green streets. These are literally wide linear parks with multiple lanes, typically uh, paths back then for all kinds of traffic, pedestrian, equestrian, bicyclist, etc. Uh, the whole idea behind what was uh, Olmsted's notion in Buffalo at this time was that it, to think of Buffalo as being contained within a giant park or system of parks. And the whole notion, even at this point in the 19th century, is that anyone, no matter where he lived, could have easy access as a pedestrian, bicyclist, equestrian, 
to a park-like environment. Easy access to a park-like environment, it's something that all parks, departments, and cities are still trying to address right now at this point in the 27th century. What century is this? 21st century. Um, and uh, it's really quite extraordinary. And this is where it all began in Buffalo. All began in Buffalo. And uh, by the way, also in Buffalo, I just want to mention this. This is the Richardson Homestead Complex in Buffalo. That's H. H. Richardson, who designed the building, by the way, Henry Hobson Richardson, more commonly known as H. H. Richardson, and it was one of the many collaborations between Olmsted and Fox throughout New York State and Massachusetts, in particular, by the way. Architecture by H. H. Richardson, landscape by Frederick L. Olmsted. This started out life, by the way, as the Buffalo Insane Asylum, and it is now a completely restored palace, convention center, meeting site, event site, hotel, gourmet restaurant, uh, artist studios and restored landscape and gardens. And if you go to Buffalo, make a little side trip to visit this. It's quite exquisite. Now, if you, uh, how about the Niagara Falls State Reservation, designed by Olmsted and Box? A little background is in order here. In the 1860s at Yosemite, Olmsted had advanced the theory that a republic had a responsibility to protect scenic beauty. And in the 1870s, he put theory into practice at the highly degraded industrial site of Niagara Falls. That is what it looked like. Yes, that is what I, now there was a little section, a little section, you had to walk up and over a little footbridge and through a blind and pay what they called a commutation fee. So you can see a little section of quasi-natural Niagara Falls. The city fathers of Buffalo said, reached out to Olmsted, Mr. Olmsted, what can we do about this? Well, Olmsted, it amounted to the, by the way, the national campaign to preserve the waterfront complex was called the Free Niagara Movement. It amounted to the first big national campaign for scenic preservation, led by Mr. Homestead, and they won. It resulted in unparalleled legislation by the city of New York to buy up the entire complex, tear down all the mills, and restore the waterfalls to as a natural a condition as possible. The first state park in the nation, by the way. And I entirely agree with the commentary in our film. Sure, the falls are powerful, but go out to Goat Island, that's the north, go out to Goat Island, Landscape by Olmsted, they actually did the entire state reservation, but their jewel was Goat Island, of the waterfall. Go out to Goat Island above the waterfall, Landscape by Olmsted and Marks. There's the Goat Island Bridge, here is the footbridge to the Three Sisters, perhaps some of you have been there, and surround yourself with those stunning rapids above the falls, with the mist rising, the roar of the falls below, it is a rich visual and oral experience. You'll experience Niagara Falls like you never have before if you've not yet been up to Goat Island. Now let's talk about John Charles Olmsted, John C. Olmsted, uh, uh, sequentially nephew, stepson, business partner of uh, Frederick Law. Uh, the young man learned his father's acute skills of reading the land, understanding soil and vegetation types, and he acquired his father's artistic skills as draftsman and landscape designer. He joined his stepfather's firm in 1875 after graduating from Yale. Before his father's retirement, he worked with his father on many projects, including the aforementioned Back Bay Fens, also the Biltmore State in North Carolina. Then, as senior partner with the Olmsted Brothers firm, he led the Essex County, New Jersey project. By the way, here is Brentwood Park in Essex County, New Jersey, with the cherry trees in full bloom. It is not only the first county-wide park system in America, to this day it's considered one of the most perfect county-wide park systems in America to this day. And this is right in Newark, New Jersey, folks. A lot of that surprises a lot of people. Now, John Charles left a huge mark in the Pacific Northwest across both urban and rural landscapes from Idaho to Victoria, BC. And he was invited out there, where I live, by the cities of Portland, Spokane, and Seattle upon his first day cost share in Essex. And he, his first visits to the area, he was struck by terrain like this. There's tall trees leading down to Puget Sound with islands and mountains in the distance. And scenes like this, I don't know if you can see Mount Rainier. Yeah, I hope you can. Here's Mount Rainier hovering in the background above the 1920s black and white of Seattle. He was struck by scenery like this, and he was convinced he had to capture the scenery in all of his park designs for the area. I do want to, by the way, he began to spend more and more time going from Boston to Portland, Boston to Port Portland, Oregon, Walked back and forth from Boston to the Pacific Northwest, I should say. And you know, it's interesting how his image, his, his whole, he changed completely. This is, he, he left Boston, the very proper Bostonian, right? He spent more and more time in the Pacific Northwest. Look what happens. <laughs> He cops, he cops a Sherlock Holmes look. The only, thing, the only thing missing is the pipe. What's up with that? You missed the pipe. The funny thing is, the same thing happened to me. I did the same thing. You never know what's going to happen when you move across the country. But this is just a semblance I put on today to look very uh, preppy or something. Anyway. 
Uh, now, enough with my silliness, I apologize. Now, uh, he did let develop the master plans for the entire park systems in these three cities and laid out many of the parks and parkways in both Seattle and Spokane. My hometown in these past 28 years, Portland, Oregon, he designed the 1905 Lewis and Clark Centennial Exposition Grounds, which put Portland on the map. All of the homesteads worked on the World's Fairs across America, by the way. And he subsequently did the same thing in Seattle with what they call the AYP Exposition of 1909 in Seattle. Now notice the sight lines. This is what's called the Court of Honor, the Drumheller Fountain. This is an artist's greatly exaggerated image of Mount Rainier. It doesn't look quite that large in reality. But take a look at the following picture. Here is the modern day campus of the University of Washington. Drumheller Fountain, Court of Honor, big in the distance is Mount Rainier. So the modern day campus of UW, the other UW, University of Washington, started with the AYP Exposition of 1909, designed entirely landscaped by John C. Homestead. Now, in Seattle, he laid out 35 parks, all with connected parkways, most of which are still there today, the most extensive park system of its kind in the Pacific Northwest. Does this look like a map I just showed you a little while ago? Of course it does. He emulated his father in, in Buffalo by doing this in Seattle. And now there's if I were doing a program in the Pacific Northwest, I would focus much more on this. I'm just going to show you some images from a few of these cities. Here is Volunteer Park. That's a vintage picture. It's still there as a modern park today. Here is a magnificent Green Lake Park, all in the city of Seattle. Here is the Washington Park Arboretum. In Portland, he master planned the entire park system of Portland. The, only, the one park that's typically pointed to as the most picture-perfect homestead park happens to be almost a neighborhood park for me. That's Laurelhurst Park in Portland, <coughs> Oregon. And in a report he wrote to the park commissioners for the city of Portland, he said, hey, you have this vast tract of forest on the West Hills overlooking your urban environment. We now call it Forest Park. Here it is positioned. Here is the industrial corridor of the Willamette River, the St. John Suspension Bridge. Here's downtown Portland in the background. That forest park is 5,200 acres, the second largest urban forest preserve in the lower 48, partly, protect, partly there thanks to John C. Olmsted recommending the city of Portland to not allow it to be developed. It is now crisscrossed with rec beautiful recreational trails for all levels of recreation, and it is a recreational paradise right in urban Portland. It's quite extraordinary. Now, uh, now before I return to Junior, I want to take a few minutes to talk about the city beautiful movement. In fact, uh, starting with the World Columbian Exposition, the elder Olmsted, that further developed his ideas for planning a comprehensive system of parks, shaping the land to create spaces that seem natural, but in fact have been highly, de highly designed to achieve a particular effect. He believed that cities could be improved by the application of the principles of landscape architecture in a democracy. Olmsted argued that the health of the republic relied on the civic health of the voting population, and that public parks in and of themselves could enhance the civic strength of a community. By the way, Lake Park, Milwaukee, is often pointed to as a picture-perfect uh, city beautiful era park. Planning with a comprehensive view was a new idea in North American cities. Up until then, cities often grew in haphazard fashion. But as the 19th century progressed, the idea of guiding city development to improve living conditions and promote economic development gained currency, what would become known as the City Beautiful Movement had its roots, in fact, in, I'll uh, use the shorthand of the WCE of 1893. And the director of that World's Fair, architect Daniel Burnham, famous for this expression, make no little plans, use the exposition to showcase how architecture, landscape design, and plan development could create the white city, the landscape, of course, designed by Frederick Law Homestead Senior. A beautiful, orderly, functional space that contrasted sharply with many chaotic and disorderly urban areas at the time. Now, I fully realize that the white city was a temporary stage that the folly and the utopian fantasy, as all world fairs were, I'm going to say were, because they don't seem to be world fairs anymore, are they? But it did set something significant in motion, including what be, would become known as the Macmillan Plan for Washington, D.C. And speaking of the Macmillan Plan, who I was reminded of a couple of days ago was a U.S. Senator from Michigan. <laughs> Let's now turn to Senior's namesake, his own son, Frederick Law Homestead, Jr was more key to the story of Cleveland, often referred to as Rick, by the way. The younger brother who also was brought into the family practice, he led a considerable mark across America, from Southern California to Florida and the nation's capital in points north, like here. Uh, he was born on Staten Island, uh, the son of Frederick Law and Mary Cleveland Perkins Olmsted. From his earlier years, young Rick Olmsted was aware of his father's fervent desire to have him carry on the family 
business and family name and profession. Uh, from early on, the father insisted that this young son become far better educated in botany and horticulture as the father felt deficient in those topics. In the waning years of his life, the father included his son, his young son, in the culminating projects of his career while still a student at Harvard. Young Olmsted spent a summer working in Daniel Burnham's office as the white city of the Chicago World's Fair arose in Chicago. And after graduating Harvard in 1894, he spent a year on site at Biltmore while the 100,000 acre estate was being developed for George Vanderbilt in Asheville, North Carolina. Here is one picture of the gardens, and I often forget to fail to mention, and it's important to understand, it's not just the gardens at Biltmore, it's the entire vast landscape that was master planned and designed to the meticulous detail by Frederick Law Homestead. It's not just the gardens. It's if you've ever been to Biltmore and you've taken the approach roads up and the approach roads back down and through that marvelous landscape, every single bit of it was designed to the individual plant by Frederick Law Homestead Sr. and his associates and his sons. Now, uh, now, upon his father's retirement, by the way, Rick became, in 1897, he became full partner with his half-brother, John Charles, in the family business. There it is. It's a National Historic Park site. You too can be greeted but there by National Park Rangers today in South Brookline, Massachusetts. Completely restored. Impeccable. Extraordinary. Landscape. Building. Drafting rooms. Uh, archives. Exhibits. Films. National Park interpretation. The whole caboodle. You too can have that experience there at the Olmsted National Historic Site in Brookline, Massachusetts. Very near a portion of the Emerald Necklace, by the way. And both sons, Frederick Law uh, Jr. and uh, John Charles, played play key roles in founding the ASLA, the American Society for Landscape Architects. And Jr., I think I have another picture of him here, he helped found and taught at the first professional program in landscape architecture in the nation. The Harvard, now we refer to it as the Harvard Graduate School of Design. And by the way, he, taught, he influenced generations of landscape designers and urban planners who would follow. Olmsted Jr. emerged on the national scene in 1901 when he was appointed to the Commission on Fine Arts for the District of Columbia, which still exists today. Every four years, I think, presidents name new members of the Commission of Fine Arts, national prestigious people to join the commission. Commonly known back then as the Macmillan Commission, at this during this time, charged with interpreting for the 20th century Pierre Charles L'Enfant's vision of the nation's capital. Olmsted Jr. worked with his father's colleagues from the Chicago World's Fair, who were still living, to transform Washington into a work of civic art. Partialism, but partial. Listing Jr.'s projects in the nation's capital reads like a guide to Washington, D.C., quite literally, including, I'm only going to show you a few, including the National Wall, the Jefferson Memorial, Roosevelt Island, the National Cathedral Grounds, the National Zoo, the White House Grounds, here indicated as the Executive Mansion, and one of every, if you work in the hothouse political atmosphere of Washington, D.C., you need a place to escape to. That would be Rock Creek Park <laughs> and the Parkway, all designed by Jim. By the way. <coughs> speaking of the nation's capital, speaking of the nation's capital, I want to remind you that Frederick Law Homestead Sr. also left his mark there. He did extensive landscaping work on the U.S. Capitol grounds, including reorienting the entrance and designing and seeing to the installation of the Capitol Steps. I'm going to repeat that just once, the Capitol Steps. Now, remember, Homestead Sr. saw all his public commissions as public spaces would Amer where Americans would enact democracy. Now, I'll leave it to you to ponder over whether the events that occurred on January 6, 2020, on the Capitol Steps, met Homestead's vision of American democracy. There will be no more commentary necessary. In August 2015, the National Park Service hosted a special event commemorating the 150th anniversary of Homestead Historic Report, Yosemite and the Mariposa Grove of Big Trees, the Yosemite Valley, and the Mariposa Grove of Big Trees. That report was largely credited with providing the basis not only of the creation of Yosemite National Park, but in fact its thoughtful wording is considered by many, including the National Park Service, to be the preamble, if you will, to the creation of our National Park Service. In fact, uh, you might remember that the National Park Service itself held a they celebrated its 100th anniversary in 2016. In fact, it was Frederick, none other than Frederick Law Homestead Jr., who wrote the language of the legislation for the Organic Act of, 20, of 1916, the founding legislation for our National Park Service, like father, like son. For 30 years, Rick advised Homestead Jr., advised the National Park Service on issues of management and the conservation of scenic resources. He and the firm left their mark on national parks from coast to coast, 
visitor centers, approach roads, trails, landscapes, etc., including Maine's Acadia National Park, notably where I'll be in a week's time, the Florida Everglades, the Great Smoky Mountains, and Yosemite. All have homestead landscapes there to this day. Now let's swing back to the East Coast, take a quick look at some of Junior's other works there, including residential communities. In fact, by the way, designing residential enclaves was something of a specialty for the Olmsteads, father and sons. Early on, the residential development by the father, of course, Riverside, Illinois. Uh, it established in 1869, both being one of the first planned garden suburbs in America. But three of Junior's residential projects from north to south include Forest Hills Gardens in Queens, Roland Park in Baltimore, and the community of Mountain Lake in Florida. Here it's listed as the Mountain Lake State's uh, Historic District. Now, look at up here, that's a carillon. Where is that carillon? It's right here. Here it is. This is Bach Tower Gardens, the jewel, the jewel in the crown of Homestead masterpieces in the entire state of Florida. It is the jewel of all of Junior's botanical gardens that he was involved with across the U.S. If you're ever in near Orlando, take an hour's ride south, go to Lake Wales, and visit the Bach Tower Gardens. Oh my goodness, is it an extraordinary place. I cannot more highly recommend that. Now, I've already provided a glimpse into the Olmsted legacy in my own region of the country, the Pacific Northwest. Where else can we find Olmsted landscapes in the West? Quickly, I'm going to take you to the Rocky Mountain states, particularly Colorado. The most significant site there is the Mountain Denver Mountain Park System uh, that can be found in Denver. Some 16 or so properties that sprawl across four counties on 14,000 acres of land, and it's, you can imagine, highly popular among the avid recreationalists, if you will, in the Denver metro area. And Junior was contracted there to master plan the entire park system starting in 1912. And uh, uh, the, most, uh, the earliest of these parks is Genesee Park, but I'm only going to show you one because perhaps you've heard of the Red Rock Amphitheater. Where is the Red Rock Amphitheater? It's in Red Rocks Park. It's part of the Denver Mountain Park System master plan by Junior. Some of you may have been to concerts there, but perhaps one of the most perfect outdoor concert venues in America, if not the world. Uh, quite extraordinary. Now, what about the Olmsted legacy in California? Well, a brief listing of Senior's work. Senior did work in California, not just Junior. We can start with the Mountain View Cemetery above the city of Oakland. That's what it looked like back then. You two can walk into Bucolic Plains today above the downtown Oakland, towering above by downtown Oakland, with the bay and that big city across the bay in the distance. It's a beautiful Bucolic historic cemetery where some of the historic notables of the state of California are interred, including Leland Stanford, by the way, among others. And speaking of whom, how about this campus? It's considered the most distinct architectural plan of its kind in the West, and it was a collaboration, a testy, contentious collaboration between client Leland Stanford, with a big ego, and architect Frederick Law Homestead. But it did result, and it took some time for them to come up with a plan that both would compromise on. Leland Stanford did overrule uh, his architect. Uh, employee, if you will, is consultant more often than not, but it did result in an architectural plan of some considerable brilliance and cohesiveness. Here's a few images of the Stanford Chapel, the Hoover Tower. Here's a look at that, how it all holds together seamlessly. And it's, it's really considered quite a brilliant how it was. This co contentious collaboration between the two resulted in this landscape design. Now, uh, we could, uh, uh, later in the 20th century, the hills and the valleys to the north, south, and east of the cities of Berkeley and Oakland beckoned Junior back out to the Berkeley Hills. And the Olmsted brothers master planned an extensive, beautiful series of wild parks. Here is the first historic park, Tilden Regional Park, just above the Ucal Berkeley, more or less, slightly to the north. But this beloved park just here's a new park that was added. But this park district now includes a portfolio of uh, 65 parks that spread well north and east of the hills of East Bay, all master planned originally by Frederick Law Homestead Jr. He did the same thing for the entire California state park system twice over in the 20th century, starting in 1928. And the final survey that they did identified 125 parks in the process. Homestead created a master plan for saving the remaining 5% of the California magnificent redwoods. You know, there are national park redwoods and there are state park redwoods. What about those wines in the Santa Cruz Mountains that were ravaged by fires in recent years? Well, they're all there because Olmsted said, hey, state of California, you need to protect your own redwoods. And he also said, hey, you have a large desert, a beautiful blooming desert in the interior. Why don't you protect it and create the largest state park in the state of California? There's the Enzo Desert in bloom. Thanks to Olmsted Jr. making that recommendation. 
Finally, in Southern California, 1913, a group of investors purchased over 25,000 acres in the Palos Verdes Peninsula and hired the Olmsted brothers to develop that expansive coastal landscape. Palos Verdes is one of the Olmsted brothers' largest and most complex projects with input from scientists, engineers, horticulturalists. It has transformed uh, hilly, shaley, uh, lime shale terrain to 16,000 acres suitable for a complete community, including residential areas, a uh, commercial center, and extensive parkland. There is Palos Verdes Estates, and that's the original real estate plan. Sorry, I didn't put that up earlier. And here is Palos Verdes today. Now, it may well be pointed to as a, it's not gated, it certainly isn't gated, but it is certainly a upper middle class community to say the least. But it has extensive public parklands and trails all open to the general public of the greater LA area. What about the Olmsted? You're wondering when are we going to get back home here to the Great Lakes? Well, what about the Olmsted legacy here in the Great Lakes? We're going to start in upstate New York. I'm going to start east, then I'm going to take you north, and then we're going to come back to Cleveland. Uh, Lake Ontario first Rochester with its own system, an entire system of Olmsted parks. That includes four principal parks, Highland Park, Genesee Valley and Seneca Park. There's also one additional park I don't have pictured here, uh, and that is Maplewood. An entire park system in Rochester, by the way. Now, you've already seen some evidence of the parks in Buffalo. I'm just going to point out that in, in Buffalo, by the way, it was where Olmsted became uh, arguably the first city planner in America, right there in Buffalo. The city of Buffalo literally planned its future development around the Olmsted park system. And additional parks that were part of the Olmsted plan include Martin Luther King Park, or, uh, now as it's called, it was formerly Humboldt Park during Olmsted's time, and the uh, South Park, where the botanical gardens are in Buffalo, which are now being restored. Buffalo has just announced they've raised a whole lot of money to do a great deal of restoration that's about to start here in these botanical gardens, and I think the entire park. There are additional parks that were added subsequently after Olmsted's own time to this wonderful park system. Let's head north to Milwaukee on Lake Michigan. In 1893, Olmsted laid out an entire park system for the Milwaukee Park Commission. Yet again, an entire park system, folks. The aforementioned Lake Park, here it is, here's a nice vintage picture, on a rise overlooking Lake Michigan. Uh, uh, and here's uh, some other images of Lake, beautiful Lake Park, also a polished jewel at this point, I dare say. He also designed a Newbury Boulevard, a tree-lined parkway that connects Lake Park with Riverside Park along the Milwaukee River, and further inland, Washington. I like vintage images, as you can see. Still in Wisconsin, after the Civil War, wealthy Chicagoans decided that an ideal place for a summer colony was Lake Geneva. Uh, an additional impetus for this movement was the Chicago Fire of 1871. Many of the well-off Chicagoan families relocated to Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, while their Chicago homes were being rebuilt. And thus, Lake Geneva would become known as the Newport of the West. This lovely lake and its surrounding community still exists today. Some of the beautiful homes, in fact, benefited from gardens designed by the Olmsted brothers. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is one of the beautiful mansions there, although I believe, in fact, this is not an Olmsted brothers garden, but this happens to be the picture that I have up at the moment. But also, uh, one public garden that is just reopened to the public. The historic, it's very historic. You can look it up at the Yerkes Observatory, with gardens just restored and reopened to the public this spring, designed by the Olmsted brothers right here on Lake Geneva, by the way. What about Chicago? Well, it's a long story, and I don't want to take too much of your time to talk about Chicago today. You've already heard hints of some of this, but you know, Olmsted and Locks were there before, long before the 1893 World Columbian Exposition. They were already there, working for the park commissioners of Chicago. Uh, in fact, here's the original plan for Jackson and Washington parks, connected by the, what we now refer to as the Midway Plaisance. Most of this pre-existed before planning. Before Daniel Werneman took the picture and he recruited Olmsted to do the landscape for the white suit.